Again, the battle of good and evil, it wages on today. Now, when Satan, when he tempted Jesus, he, we're told in the fourth chapter of Matthew's gospel, if you want to take a look at it for yourself, we're told in the eighth and in the ninth verse that Satan, he took Christ up on an exceedingly high mountain and that he showed Christ, he showed them the kingdoms of the world and, and their glory. And the scripture tells us that Satan, he said to Jesus after he had done that, he said, all these things, I will give you the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give you if you will fall down, the devil said there, if you will fall down and worship me. Now, I want you to seriously take a look at those words there. And I want you to consider what it was that Satan sought for Jesus to do there. Again, look closely at those words there. And, and I say to you today that if the devil, if Satan, if he will try Jesus in such a manner, Satan, he will certainly try you as well. Now let us understand here today, for one to fall down or, or for one to, to bow before another is for one to subject themselves to the authority of another. That is to do as a servant would do before their master. So let's understand here that the devil, let's understand here that Satan, that he saw himself as the master over Christ in this moment here. Do y'all get that there? Do y'all realize that there? The devil, he sought for Christ to subject himself to him, to his power and to his authority. The devil thought that he had some kind of power and authority that he could subject Jesus Christ to. Now, the reason why I, I share this example again with you this Sunday, as I did last Sunday, is because this is a prime example of the spiritual battle of good and evil that all of us are a part of today, the battle in which we face today as well. Evil, I want you to understand today, that evil, it desires for good to surrender itself to it, to its power, and to its authority. That is again what evil will do. Your conviction of faith, it is being tested today. Your conviction of Christ, your conviction of faith in Christ, it is being tested today, just as Satan tested the conviction of Christ heart himself. In his pride, evil, it believes its way to be better than any other way. It believes its way to be better than the Lord's way. And it, again, it desires to bring all of us into subjection to its way. And so the question that I ask you today is, will you do that? Will you live in subjection to the way of evil? Will you bow down to the wicked? Will you bow down to the evil? Will you bow down to the way of sin? I got some uh-uhs. Thank you, Auntie. Now, when he was tested, you'll see there in the 10th verse that Jesus, he responded to Satan. He said to Satan, away with you. And Jesus said to Satan, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. You shall serve is what Jesus said to the devil there. And again, I ask all of you today, who is it that you will bow down to? Who is it that you will bow down to? Who is it that you will serve today? And see, Jesus, he said to us that there are two masters that, that we can choose between living up under. Over in the sixth chapter of Matthew's gospel and the 24th verse, you see that Jesus, he said that nobody 
can serve God and mammon, mammon being sin. Nobody, Jesus said, can serve the two. The reason why nobody can serve the two is because again, we would end up loving one while despising the other. Again, listen to me closely today. You cannot live under God and live under sin at the same time. You cannot serve God. You cannot serve sin at the same time. The reason why is because you will love one more than the other. You will you'll begin to despise the other. And often is the case that man would choose to despise the Lord over the way of sin. You see, the Lord, he desires for us to worship him and him alone. He desires for us to worship him in spirit and in truth. The Lord, he does not desire for you to serve him half heartedly. So we'll see there that Jesus, he wasn't about serving his father half heartedly, was he? Jesus, he didn't bow down before Satan, did he? Jesus, he put Satan, he put sin far behind him, didn't he? And we'll see there that he served the Lord. And in serving the Lord, Christ, he fulfilled his calling, didn't he? And in fulfilling his calling, he, he has made it possible for all people to have freedom from the bondage of sin. So again, the question that everybody must answer today is whether or not we will live in subjection to sin. Will you bow down to sin? I got an uh uh again there. Or will you choose to, to live under the grace of God? And so, again, we are going to be taking another look at the book of Daniel this week. As I again continue to take a look at the battle of good and evil. Because again, as I said last Sunday, there is a battle taking place in our world today. There is a spiritual battle taking place right now between good and evil. What side are you on? Again, I asked this week. Now in the third chapter of Daniel there, I want us to focus on the conviction here again. But this time we'll look at the conviction of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And as we look at their conviction, I also want us to pay very close attention to the actions of the King Nebuchadnezzar there as well. Now we'll recall that these young men, they had gone through the Babylonian assimilation process uh, with, with Daniel. Like Daniel, they had had their names changed to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. And we'll even remember that the, the king that Nebuchadnezzar that he tried to change, he tried to force his diet onto them as well. But again, thanks to the conviction of Daniel, thanks to the faith that he had in his heart, we know that they did not take part of the king's diet. Mm -hmm. And so here in the third chapter of Daniel, we'll once again see an attempt to get these men to conform. We'll see another attempt here. To, to get these men to defile themselves once again to the way of sin. Would they defile themselves? Would they corrupt themselves? Would they conform themselves to wicked and evil to sin? Again, in this battle of good versus evil. So this chapter here of Daniel, it opens up there in the first verse with Nebuchadnezzar having had an image covered in gold, set up, we're told, there in a province that was in or of Babylon. This, this image we'll see there in that scripture there, we're told that it stood at a height of 90 feet tall. It was a very tall image, wasn't it? And we're told there that it was nine feet wide as well. Very interesting dimensions that we have there. This was an image that because it was so tall and because it was set up in a plane, 
It would be something that would be spotted at great distances, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the story behind the, the making of this image is it's not certain, but I don't think that it is a coincidence that the story about this image, that it appears in scripture after Daniel had interpreted a dream of Nebuchadnezzar and the image that he saw in a dream over in the second chapter of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, he had this dream of an image that, that nobody was able to, uh, to be able to interpret. Nobody could tell him about until it, Daniel came along and interpreted the dream for him. In the dream, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw, he saw an image, which again, Daniel explained to him what the image, what it represented. The head of the image, Daniel explained, it was of gold and it represented Nebuchadnezzar. Who Daniel explained, it represented that Nebuchadnezzar was the king of kings at that time. That's something that you'll see in the scripture of the second chapter of Daniel. However, bit by bit, Daniel, he explained that the image, that it collapsed. He explained that the image, that it was destroyed by the rise of a future kingdom, which was represented by iron, and that iron, it destroyed all of that image or that statue, if you will. Now, rather than Nebuchadnezzar seeing this dream as a warning sign given to him by the Lord through Daniel's interpretation of the dream, we'll see that Nebuchadnezzar, he chose to be defiant mm -hmm. in his way. Mm -hmm. We'll see that Nebuchadnezzar, he chose the way of pride and the way of ego. Nebuchadnezzar, we're told there again, there in the third chapter of Daniel, we're told that he had an image constructed. And instead of just the head being gold, like he saw in his dream, he had the whole image. He had it all covered in gold. Yeah, like I said, he was a man who was defiant, a man driven by pride and ego. Nebuchadnezzar, in having this image made and covered in gold, he was, again, rather than being humble, heeding God's warning, he spit in the face of God. Pride and ego. He spat in the face of God. He saw himself as a God. Nebuchadnezzar, he believed himself to be indestructible. And I hope that you're paying close attention to the words that I'm sharing with you here, what scripture says to us about Nebuchadnezzar here. And so after having this image constructed, having it set up in this plane, we're told there in the third or in the fourth and the fifth verse there that Nebuchadnezzar, he sent out a command to all the people in the province that they were to fall down that they were to worship the golden image at the sounding of the symphony. And in the sixth verse, we're told there that in his command here, that, that Nebuchadnezzar said that those who, who chose not to bow, those who chose not to fall down, those who chose not to serve and worship that image of gold, they were to be immediately cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace to their death. Does it sound like Nebuchadnezzar was a man who was taking actions that were righteous? They got some groans and some no's there, some quiet no's. Does it sound like he was a man who was of righteousness, was it? This man, he sounds like he was a wicked man, doesn't he? He sounds like he was a wicked and an evil king, doesn't he? Trying to force, trying to dictate onto others what they better had done. If they didn't do it, they would die. Nebuchadnezzar said that, right? Even worse about this is that the fact that he was trying to force, force his subjects, I use air quotes there on the subjects, 
that he's trying to force them into what was idolatry, right? He's trying to force them into sin. Let's make a note about this for a moment here. You see, this is what wicked and evil people will do when they can't get things their way. What I mean by that is that wicked and evil people, they tend to try to force people to, to do what they want them to do. They try to dictate to others what they should and better do. They try to force people to, to conform to them. Now, whether or not this worship was sincere, the seventh verse, it shows us that the people, that they actually did what was commanded. Again, we don't know if this was out of a, a sincere heart, but again, we see that there was a, a showing of worship at the sounding of the symphony. See, to get their way, evil men, they love to fear monger. And I believe that's something that had happened here. You better worship this image or you will die. And so the people, again, fearing for their life, they did the outward showing of worship. And this is what evil men love to do. They love to fear monger. They love to, to, to spout a whole bunch of fear and doom in order to control people who will give in to their words of fear and to their words of doom. You see, I share these words with you today because we today, again, in this battle of good and evil, I tell you that we must always be wary of those who love to spread fear and doom. I don't know if you hear me here today. And you must always be cautious about the one who loves to spread fear, the ones who love to spread doom. If you don't do what I say you should do, then this bad thing will happen. A whole bunch of that is being said today. And again, this is being done to control one's thoughts and to control their actions. Now, we'll see there in that 12th verse, as we continue to take a look at the third chapter of Daniel here, that while others were bowing down to Nebuchadnezzar's image of gold, the three young men, they refused. They were not participating in that idol worship. You see, these young men, they had learned from Daniel's conviction, didn't they? And, and, and you see, Something that I want to say about old Daniel's conviction of faith and the conviction that we should be living with today is that when you stand by your convictions, your convictions, you standing by them, it can rub off on those that are around you. You can encourage others to do the same when they are tried, when they are tested in, in their faith. You can encourage them by your own convictions. You can encourage them to be able to take a stand. Now, just because you stand by your conviction, that doesn't mean that the wicked are going to give up right away. Because the wicked, the evil, they have their own convictions. And as I said last week, they're going to fight hard in their convictions. Again, I want you to see Nebuchadnezzar there. A man who thought himself to be like a guy. Those that think themselves to be guys, they don't like it when someone stands up to them. When someone stands up to them, they will frown. They will throw a temper tantrum. They will get upset. They will rage. Look at what Nebuchadnezzar did there in the 13th verse. Nebuchadnezzar, we're told there he was full of rage and fury. After hearing that the young men, that they wouldn't bow down to his gods, that they didn't fall down and, and serve and worship his image of gold. It's interesting that that some think that it is okay to defy God, but when they are defied, oh boy, it's okay for them to say no to God. It's okay for them to go in their own way, but don't you defy them. You 
So we'll see there that Nebuchadnezzar, he had the young men brought before him as a means to say to them, I bet you won't defy me to my face. And when they stood before him, there in the 14th and the 15th verse, again, look at Nebuchadnezzar in his actions. Nebuchadnezzar, again, he dictated to them that they better bow down, that they better do as they are told to do. You better fall down and you better worship that image of gold. And again, we'll see there that he threatened them with their lives again. If you don't do it, you will meet your death. You'll be thrown into the furnace. You see, Nebuchadnezzar, he thought he was showing some kind of power there, didn't he? He thought he was showing some kind of authority there, didn't he? And I tell you that to me, maybe it's just me that feels this way, but to me, he comes off as being whiny. To me, he comes off being small there. To me, he comes off being weak there. But again, maybe that's just me. I don't know if y'all feel the same way. See, most of those that portray themselves as a tough guy, they take on that tough guy image. Most of them are pathetic and weak. Just keeping it real. That's why they always seek to, to be glorified. That's why they always seek for somebody to, to applaud them and to be praised. They love to be built up. With one last showing of power, we'll see there that Nebuchadnezzar, he said to the young man in a question, he said, who is the God, he said, who will deliver you from my hands? Again, look at how powerful Nebuchadnezzar believed himself to be. And who is the God, he said there, that can deliver you from, from my hands? You know, there was somebody else in scripture that, that spoke this way. I don't know if y'all remember this fellow, but there was somebody else in scripture who spoke this way. If you don't know who I'm talking about, I'm talking about old Pharaoh. Pharaoh, he spoke this same way to, to some of God's children. When Pharaoh, when he said to Moses, who is the Lord that I shall obey his voice? There's a whole bunch of them saying that today. Who is God that I should listen to him? Who is God that I should pray to him? Who is God that I should be going to church? Who is God that I should open up scripture and learn about him and know him? Because a lot of us, we see ourselves as gods. And while sin can certainly be a master over man, there is one, I tell you today, who stands over sin. I tell you today that there is one who has all power in his hand. You see, the one that stands over everything has said, in the world you have tribulation, but he said to us, be of good cheer. And the reason why he said that is because he said to us, I have overcome the world. Any and everything that the world can throw at you, our Lord has said, I have overcome all of it. I want you to understand that none of God's children have reason to cower. None of us have reason to fall down. None of us have reason to ever give in to the wicked and to the evil. You have no reason that you should ever be fearful of the wicked and the evil. In their conviction of faith, we'll see there that the three young men, they showed that kind of conviction there in my key verse for today. There in the 17th verse, at the start of my key verses, 17th and 18th verse, by the way, are my key verses for today. We'll see that the young men, they said to this, this king that saw himself as a God, they said to him, our God, whom we serve, is able. Do you believe your God is able today? Again, they said they're our God. When Nebuchadnezzar said, who God, what God? They said, our God, who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hands. 
I feel like that's what we need to be saying to, to the wicked and the evil today. Let's see, let me, let me just tell y'all this today. This is how you stand up to the wicked and to the evil. Those that think themselves to be kings, those that think themselves to be gods, those that want others to fall down to them, those that want others to worship them, tell them today, no, no, no. My God, my God, he is able. That's why we worship him. That is why we serve him. Because again, our God, he is able. You have no reason to back down today. Don't back down to the wicked and to the evil. You don't cower to the wicked and to the evil. Do not surrender to sin today. God's children have no reason whatsoever to ever give in to the demands of the wicked and the evil. Now here's where I'm going to throw you all a twist and a curveball in, in my sermon, in my message here for today. You see, whether you realize this or not, we are living in a type of Babylon today. Our world is shrouded in wickedness. And I tell you that this wickedness that our world is shrouded in today, it is not trying to hide itself from us. The wickedness of today, it is a nasty, it is a vile kind of wickedness that again is trying to force itself on not just us, but onto all people. In, to, in today's world, I, I feel I must ask all of us, are you Nebuchadnezzar or are you the young Hebrew boys that we're seeing here today? Which one are you in the battle of good and evil? Are you Nebuchadnezzar or are you one of the young Hebrew boys or young men that we're seeing here today in our sermon? What side are you on on the battle of good and evil? Now, true Christians, yeah, we ought to know how to live in this type of Babylon. We ought to know how to live in this world today. But sadly, so many so-called Christians, and I use air quotes there, have chosen to surrender to the ways of wicked and the evil. Many professed believers today have chosen to be like Nebuchadnezzar in this world. Now, some of you may begin to wonder, well, pastor, what do you mean by this? I ask you. Did you pay close attention to Nebuchadnezzar's actions? Did you pay close attention to the things that Nebuchadnezzar was saying and the things that Nebuchadnezzar was doing? We've said here that he was not taking actions of righteousness, which means that his actions, they were evil, they were wicked, and they were sinful, right? There when the young men refused Nebuchadnezzar's religion, when they refused to bow down to his image of gold, what did he do? He was adamant in trying to make them do what he said that they should do. Nebuchadnezzar, I want you to understand today, was making another attack against their freedoms, their God-given freedom. All of us, again, created in the image of God, we have been given freedom of choice. And there Nebuchadnezzar was attacking their choice, their ability to choose whether they would do what was sinful or what was righteous. And there Nebuchadnezzar was trying to tear away, trying to take away their freedoms, their freedom of choice. Again, like I said, there is a twist that I feel is necessary for me to talk about in today's quote unquote Christianity. I don't know if you all have picked up on it. I don't know if you all have realized it, but the Christianity of today is more about false religion than it is true faith. What do I mean by that? 
Many so-called believers today are only Christians in word, whereas, again, the Lord has said that true worship is done in spirit and in truth. There are many today who proclaim to, to be of faith, but their actions, they oppose that of love. They oppose that of liberty. They oppose that of justice. And guess what? Scripture has said to us, the Lord has said himself, those are the things that he loves. God, he desires for us to love each other. And y'all have heard me say it a million times. God, he desires for us to uplift each other. Again, if we know that God loves liberty, if we know that God loves justice, why are we not doing what it is that he loves why are so many so-called believers, so many professed believers, why are they doing the opposite of what God loves? You see, forcing things onto others when they disagree with you is not what God loves. I don't know if you hear me here today. God, he does not love suppression. God, he does not love oppression. Again, he loves for us to work together, to uplift. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you hear me here today. God, he does not love tearing down, bringing down somebody. When in the world did God do that to us? Forcing someone to worship an, an image of gold, that is not something that the Lord would love for us to do. But so many of us, we go around with our golden crosses, don't we? And we try to force it into somebody's face. But I tell you today, if they have chosen to do otherwise, that is their choice. Has God ever dictated to us what we should or should not do? No. Somebody going to say, well, no, yeah, yeah, he has, Pastor. No, he hasn't. You see, Christ came into the world and said what we should do or what he was trying to persuade us to do. Trying to convince us to repent, to turn away from sin and to follow him. Nobody likes to be dictated to. Even if you're trying to dictate Christ, nobody likes to be dictated to. Paul, he said it best when he said that because we know of the terror of God's judgment, we should persuade others, Paul said, being compelled to do so by the love of Christ. Again, persuade, convince. That is what should be God's children, us. That is what should be our way. See, there's a difference between persuading, convincing and then dictating. There is a drastic difference there. So in the battle of good and evil, I, I say to all of you today that we, God's children, we ought not be like Nebuchadnezzar. You understand what I mean by that? In the battle of good and evil, you ought not be on the side of evil trying to tear away people's rights, trying to take away their freedoms. You ought not be on that side. The side that we, God's children, should be on is that what is for freedom, for liberty, and for justice. In this battle, we must be like Daniel. In this battle, we must be like these young men here who was taking a stand by own faith, by their convictions. See, in this battle, we, we must be true to our identity in Christ. Who are you? Is what I asked last week, and I ask you again this week. Are you a child of God today? I got a couple of uh-huhs. You see, if somebody asked me if I was a child of God, I would say to them loudly, oh, yeah, I am. I don't know about y'all. Y'all kind of mumbled it. Didn't say anything. But I'm a child of God. 
Let me tell you today, when you know who you are, you know what you're living for. You know what you're fighting for. But that's the problem today. Many of us don't know who we are. And when you surrender your identity, when you give up your identity today, you lose your power, you lose your authority, and you'll fall down, you'll bow down to anything. Again, like I said last week, I ain't bowing down to no one who's wicked. I'm not bowing down to the evil, and I'm not bowing down to sin. I don't know about y'all, but that's me. Now, when we take a look here at this scripture again, there in the third chapter, in the 18th verse of Daniel, we'll see here that these three young men here, we'll see that they looked evil in the eyes here. Evil had called for them to stand before him and said, hey, I bet you won't defy me to my face. But these young men, they look evil in his eyes. And they said to him in the second of my key verses, they said to him, we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. This is how you defeat evil. This is how you defeat wickedness. You take a stand. You stand by your convictions. You see, these young men here, they completely shut the door. They slammed that door. They slammed the door on evil, on wickedness. These young men, they completely shut the door to sin's hunger, to dictate to them what they should do. That's what sin does. It's a dictating ruler. Dictating what you should do. And what you should do it is, is always against, it's always against the Lord's way. Nothing good comes from sin. In the battle of good and evil, I tell you today that we must take the same stance. We must take the same stance with our authority. And with that authority, we must slam the door on the wicked and the evil. We must shut the door on that which is sinful. And we do that by completely refusing, refusing sin, by completely refusing the wicked and the evil. The wicked and the evil, they must know that we don't accept their actions of wickedness. We don't accept their lies. We don't accept their fear mongering and we don't accept their doom spiraling. We who are God's children, we live with hope in our hearts. We live by faith in the Lord in what God can and will do. And you cannot take that away from me. I will not surrender my hope in the Lord to you who are wicked and evil. I don't know about y'all today. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar, he saw their absolute refusal. And we'll see there that he still believed he had the final say over them. Mm -hmm. Look there at that 21st and the 22nd verse there. Nebuchadnezzar, he had these young men, he had them thrown into that fiery furnace, and they were still wearing their coats, their trousers. They were still wearing their turbans and their garments. He desired for their death to be painful and excruciating, mm -hmm. throwing them in there like that. You see, when the wicked and the evil, when they realize that they have lost control, when they realize that they have lost the battle, this is what they do. They try to cause a whole bunch of chaos. They try to cause a whole bunch of construction. Should we, or destruction, I should say there. Should we be afraid? Should we be afraid that, of, of them trying to do that? The exceedingly hot furnace was supposed to be their death, wasn't it? It was supposed to be the death of these young men, but again, they had already won. Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us there in the 25th verse that as Nebuchadnezzar, as he looked in, we're told there that he was astonished at what he beheld, at what he saw there. He said, hey, three of them went in there, but now there's four that are standing there. They was tossed in there, laying down on the ground, but now they up on their feet. Not only are they up on their feet, but, but these four, they're walking around in the midst 
of this, this burning fire in the midst of the flames. They're walking around, they're moving around like the flames not even touching them. Like, it, like it's not harming them. And he had wonder what God could deliver them from his hands. I tell you what, the one God did show up. Wondering what God can deliver you. You ain't got no power, the Lord said. The same that happened to Pharaoh happened to Nebuchadnezzar here. The one and true God showed up in the midst of the flames for his children. Do you believe God would show up for you just like that? When the wicked and the evil, when they try you, do you believe that God would do the same for you? You see, the Lord has said that when we pass through waters, he has said that he will be with us. The Lord has said that when we pass through rivers, he has said that they won't overflow us. The Lord God, he has said to us that when we walk through fire, he has said that we will not be burned nor scorched. You see, in this Babylon, we have our trials and we have our tribulations. We have our afflictions. The evil, they try to surround us. As Paul said, we are hard pressed on every side. Sometimes it can feel like the walls are, are closing in on us. But are we crushed? Are we crushed? Are we crushed today? They say pressure can form a diamond. You see, in this Babylon where good and evil is being fought, I tell you today, that we must live knowing that our God is our keeper. Do you know God is your keeper today? Amen. To the disciples, Jesus said that his sheep are in his care and he gives them everlasting life, Jesus said. To those that think that they can take us out of his hands, Jesus said, can't nobody snatch you out of my hands. You see, I tell you today, in this battle, we must make God our refuge. Again, we must not become Nebuchadnezzar. We must be like these young men. Mm -hmm. When God is your refuge, you have nothing to fear. Mm -hmm. Not even the threats of the evil and the wicked. Mm -hmm. God, I tell you today, he will not let your soul be moved. The Lord, as David said, is the light of our salvation. Mm -hmm. Who shall we fear? Mm -hmm. As David said, God is the strength of our life. Of whom should we be afraid? Nobody. Nobody. You have nobody to fear. You have nobody to be afraid of. I ain't afraid of nobody today. Because my God is almighty. That's the conviction of my faith. I have hope. And I know that I will overcome. Though the battle of good and evil, though it wages on, I tell you today that if you have made God your refuge, again, I tell you, you have nothing to fear. We have no need to bow down in fear. We have no need to cower. Keep on standing by faith and the Lord will make a way for you. The fact of the matter is that we ought to be standing and we ought to be fighting today in this battle of good and evil. The reason why that is, is because God, he always wins. My God, he never loses. The Braves may lose, the Hawks may lose, the Falcons, they may lose. And there are times where, where I may trip up, but my God, he always lifts me up. So again, I encourage all of you today, have the conviction here of Daniel and his friends, as we have seen here today. Don't be afraid to look the wicked and the evil in the eyes and tell them that your God will, that your God will deliver you. Never bow down to sin. Don't ever give sin the victory. It cannot win. It can't even earn the victory. I hope you hear me here today. Put on the whole armor, I tell you again today. Put on the whole armor of God, stand with conviction against evil. And again, I tell you, when all of us, when we all come together, 
all of us, we will win. We will stand victorious over the wicked and the evil. This battle of good and evil, it ain't really a battle. It's not really a battle because God has already won. And because he has already won, we have already won. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's message and I hope that you'll share it with someone somewhere. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you like this video, follow the channel as well as hit the alert bell so that you don't miss any notifications, so that you don't miss any of the wonderful videos that we share here on the Newfound Faith YouTube channel.